Live NFL trivia every Tuesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge and have a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. The year is 1986, and America loves action movies. It seemed like every big movie at the box office during the second half of the year was an action flick of some kind. You had Aliens, you had Crocodile Dundee, you had the Karate Kid 2, and of course, you had Top Gun taking you on a highway to the danger zone. But there was one action film that flew under the radar. One action film that never got a theatrical release, and just went straight to video. It's an action film so obscure, that I'm not even sure how many of you have heard of it or seen it before this video. May I introduce you to Masters of the Gridiron. In 1986, the Cleveland Browns made a 15-minute action movie. I'm going to repeat myself so that that statement sinks in. The Cleveland Browns made a movie. In the over 100-year history of the NFL, this movie might be the most bizarre piece of media to exist. It's full of 80s cheesiness and campiness, and it's got this bizarre charm about it. Nothing like it has been attempted before, and nothing like it has been attempted since. So today, we're going to look at... Well, whatever the heck this is. This is the story of the time that the Cleveland Browns made a movie. I know I say in a lot of videos that usually we need some context to understand how we got to this point. But in this case, we really need some context as to how this movie came to be. And for this, we flash back one year to late 1985, which is where our story begins. It's December 2nd, 1985, and we've got a big Monday Night Football game between the Chicago Bears and the Miami Dolphins. Chicago enters this game undefeated with a perfect 12-0 record. They've shut out each of their last two opponents. They've held their opponents to 10 points or less in each of their last seven games. They're on pace to be one of the greatest teams in the history of the NFL. And on national TV, the Dolphins humiliate them. Miami wins 38-24 in one of the most iconic games in the over half-century-long history of Monday Night Football. Dan Marino and company expose Chicago's vaunted 4-6 defense. A loss like that, especially after being undefeated, can demoralize a team. Why do I bring this up? Because the very next day, the Bears tape this. all know the song. The Super Bowl Shuffle was a huge hit and has to be the biggest song in NFL history. Yes, the 49ers did something similar the year before, but that didn't really go anywhere. The Super Bowl Shuffle, on the other hand, was a cultural phenomenon, especially after the Bears ended up making it to Super Bowl 20, where they destroyed the Patriots 46-10 to win their first and only Super Bowl in franchise history. The song peaked just outside the top 40 on the Billboard Hot 100. It was nominated for a Grammy, getting nominated for Best Rhythm and Blues Performance by a duo or group with vocal. While it didn't win, the fact that the Bears were competing against Run DMC, Cameo, and Prince and the Revolution for a Grammy is incredible. Technically speaking, you can say that the Chicago Bears shuffling crew were one-hit wonders. It helped that the song was catchy, it helped that it was unique, it helped that the team had some great personalities, and it helped that the team wound up winning the Super Bowl and ended up cementing its legacy as one of the greatest teams ever. Naturally, whenever something gets big, people try to copy it. They try and replicate the formula. After the Bears pulled this off and actually achieved success both on the field and in the studio, it seemed as though every group of players tried to become the next music sensation. The Seahawks released a country song with a saxophone solo in the middle. The Patriots released a song that tried to replicate the sounds of Up With People. Why anyone would try to replicate the sounds of Up With People, I don't know. The Raiders released a rock song. And the Rams released what is undoubtedly the best of the bunch, releasing Ram It, which still holds up to this day. Between the good, the bad, and the very ugly, a bunch of teams tried replicating the Super Bowl Shuffle. And the Browns wanted to jump in on the bandwagon. They wanted their own piece of media for people to identify them by. There was just one condition. They did not want to do a song. They didn't want to try and replicate the Super Bowl Shuffle. 
apparently, the impetus for deciding not to do a song was watching Mike Singletary try and rap, which, let's be honest, is probably a good reason to not do that. I'm Samurai Mike, I stop from cold. Part of the defense, big and bold. But what else could the Browns do to hop on this trend that wasn't a song? Mike Babb, who had been with the Browns since 1982 and had been the team's starting center since 1983, had an idea. His wife, Lois, worked in video production. The year that Babb was drafted, a movie came out that was pretty successful called Conan the Barbarian. He was a huge fan, and there was already a mythos to this as well, as Babb had a fan club in the stadium known as Babb's Barbarians where people would be dressed up in medieval costumes for the game. Instead of wearing cheese or waving a yellow towel, you dressed up like you were born 900 years ago. With all of those elements together, Bab, alongside with some teammates, met with a local comedy writer named Rick Deshawn. Within two or three hours, with lots of wine flowing at this meeting, the plan went from an idea to a fully realized script. And with that, the wheels were in motion. Most Browns players quickly hopped on the idea after they learned that they were going to be barbarians. The film was shot over the course of two consecutive Tuesdays, since that is an off day around the league. A few months later, the film was released, and the end result has to be seen to be believed. The link to the film is in the description below. Now, it's time to break it down. Roll the tape. We start with the scene in the locker room as the Browns are getting ready for their game against the Detroit Lions. You see the usual things that go on in the locker room, like putting on eye black, putting on your shoulder pads, getting your feet taped up while reading a comic book, whatever the heck this is. Then the fun and games stop as the Browns are given a very important message by the mayor. Think of Herb Brooks' speech in Miracle. This blows that out of the water. Good luck out there today. I'd really like to see you guys bring home a championship ring to Cleveland. Right. How inspirational. Anyway, enough of that. We got some football to play. What's funny about this is that this is all actual game footage from their game against the Lions. They picked a good game to film. In real life, they won this game 24 to 21 to improve to 500 after four weeks. Some Grim Reaper-like character asked the fan to sit down. This has no relevance on the plot, and why it's in here, I'm not entirely sure. Also, you know how when you watch old game footage from the 60s and earlier, how the crowd is all dressed up in their Sunday best? In the 80s, at least in Cleveland, the fans did a complete 180. Check out how many shirtless dudes you see in this shot just in the first few rows. However, as the game is underway, play stops as Bab gets injured, and a few of his teammates and the trainer try to get him to wake up. With that, we enter the crux of this movie which is this bizarre dream sequence that Bab has while he's laying on the ground with a concussion. I've never gotten a concussion before, knock on wood. But if this is what it's like for players when they get concussions, then there's no reason it should have taken the NFL more than 25 years after this movie came out to start taking concussion protocol seriously. Anyways, Bab enters this dream sequence where he encounters the ruler of the city by the lake called Erie. Yes, that's his actual name. The ruler tells him that he must go on a quest to obtain a ring worn by the masters of the gridiron. As for who he has to fight on this quest, You will have to do battle with the mysterious Lord's Beasts. Beasts such as bears, rams, and falcons. Hold up. Bears, rams, and falcons? Bears, rams, and falcons. But one of these things just doesn't belong here, and now it's time to play our game. I get the Bears. They're the defending Super Bowl champion. I get the Rams. They went 11-5 and five the year before and made it to the NFC Championship as the number two seed. No issues there. But the Falcons? I get that you had to go with some creatures and whatnot, but why the Falcons? They went 4-12 and 12 the year before and allowed the most points in all of football, allowing 452 that season. And even if they were Super Falcons on steroids that could fly at the speed of sound, all you have to do is wait until the fourth quarter to start and you'll be fine. In terms of other teams that would have made sense, why not Eagles, who are 7-9 and nine and at least respectable? Even though they're not an animal, you could go Giants, who went 10-6 and six the year before and won a playoff game. I don't know why I feel the need to break down this line like I'm trying to decipher the plot of a Christopher Nolan movie, but I digress. After receiving the message and the two sides pretend that they're fourth graders playing a game at lunchtime, 
Bab gathers the players together, which is known as the Clan of Modella. Naming the warriors after Art Modell definitely did not age poorly. As the players get gathered up, what's cool about this is that Bab was the one who drew the map. He not only came up with the names for all the different lands, but he was also the one who drew it. The names are pretty creative, including the lands of Pass Russian, Linebacker, Recivus, and Korda, which contains this scene. Hey Goliath, prepared for battle. <laughs> Oddly enough, that scream you heard was the exact audio of Browns fans when Red Right 88 happened. This part just keeps getting weirder and weirder. It starts off normal enough. Beating someone up? Fine. Carrying lumber? Fine. A magical wizard that just shows up thanks to some incredible special effects? Okay. Whatever on earth is going on here? We're starting to go off the rails a bit. And we officially go off the rails by saving the best for last, when starting cornerback Hanford Dixon just barks like a dog for no reason. <laughs> Alright then. With all of the Avengers now assembled, Bab was going over the game plan to obtain the ring. That's when this legitimately funny moment happens. For the journey will be a dangerous one. Must be from the USFL. <laughs> <laughs> Fun fact, this part was not in the original script. He was not supposed to fall down. He just tripped on accident. And then someone ad-libbed the line about the USFL. Remember that this movie came out in 1986, which was during the peak of the war between the two leagues, where the USFL sued the NFL for monopolistic practices after the USFL tried to move their season to the fall. There was some bad blood between the two leagues, and this joke pretty much captured that. The delivery isn't great, but I have to admit that much like how 90% of this movie plays out, I did not see that coming at all. After literally 45 seconds of the players just jogging to the castle of the Lord of the League, we're introduced to the villain of this movie, played by the late ukulele player Tiny Tim. I feel like every quintessential So Bad It's Good movie has one actor that is way too good for this and just plays his role perfectly. As an example, if you've ever seen The Room, it is a glorious train wreck that might be one of my favorite movies of all time just because of how bad and hysterical it is. But there's one scene involving a character named Chris R. He's in another stratosphere with how good his acting is compared to the rest of the cast. That's what Tiny Tim is here. He is just perfect for this role and embraces the chaos. He is a joy to watch on the screen. If you have seen this movie before, you realize at this scene just how limited the music budget is. They use the exact violin sound effect every time something mysterious happens. No, that is not an exaggeration. Listen to how many times throughout the movie I counted that violin being played. Stand! Warriors, please do speak. Come forth, my foul, you warrior lord. After this encounter with Tiny Tim, the players are told that in order to obtain the ring, they must defeat their enemies. If you thought this movie was weird already, don't worry. It's about to get a whole lot weirder. Because this fight scene pretty much has everything going on. First off, the entire fight is taking place in the middle of a music video, because of course it is. Imagine Thriller, but with football players fighting, and that's kind of what this is. Before we go any further, the song during this incredible montage is by the Michael Stanley Band, who had a couple of minor hits in the 80s, but nothing huge. The song is called Hard Die the Heroes, and this is a legitimately great song. I have no idea why the band never released it as a single, because it's really good and catchy and it fits right into the scene. Now, as for the fight scene, this feels like a good time to mention that the Cleveland Browns had no idea that any of this was taking place. They had no idea that their players were spending Tuesdays off filming the movie. Because if they did, they would have shut this down immediately. Why? Well, let's just say I don't think the coaching staff would have taken too kindly to player sword fighting, doing martial arts, or in one instance, their starting center fighting a bear. Yes, this is a real trained bear. It is not a person in a bear costume. It is not CGI or added in post. That is a real bear that Mike Babb is fighting. It has no relevance on the plot whatsoever. He just decided that he wanted to fight a bear. Because why not? None of the players got injured while filming this, although one of the extras almost lost a finger. Seriously, the man who got carried off here almost lost his finger while performing the fights. This fight scene makes no sense whatsoever. Why is it in the middle of an 80s music video? Why is there a bear? 
Why are there martial artists fighting? Why is the Lord of the League's assistants fighting him? I don't know the answer to any of these questions, but as is to be expected, the Browns win the fight, and Bab goes to the castle to try and acquire the ring. After getting through the final boss battle in the best one-on-one -on -one fight sequence in Star Wars, it looks as though Bab is about to get the ring and become a master of the gridiron. But it was not meant to be, as the Lord knocks out Bab. And I don't think there's a single shot in this film where the assistant isn't smiling. Just look at this. No! I mean, come on, I think even Barney the Dinosaur would ask her to take it down a few notches. After getting knocked out, Bab wakes up on the football field in the middle of the game, but without his uniform on. However, he has the ring. He was officially a master of the gridiron. And with that, the credits roll. I don't even know how to begin to describe this movie. The acting isn't good, the plot is nonsensical, and there's so much random stuff happening in the movie that I don't even know where to begin. But I have to say that I love it. Babs said that he wanted the movie to be slapstick, stupid, and fun. And I have to say that's a pretty good description. If that is what he set out to make while making this movie, then mission accomplished. So why is this movie relatively unknown? Unlike the Super Bowl Shuffle, why did this movie, outside of Cleveland, never really seem to take off? Let's take a look at what happened after the film got released. On November 3rd, 1986, Masters of the Gridiron was officially released onto VHS for 1995. All the proceeds went to United Way, which is why the NFL was okay with this film coming out to begin with. Entering November, the Browns were a solid team. They were 5-3, but they had a negative point differential, were in a dogfight battle with the Bengals for the AFC Central crown, and were in danger of missing the postseason with how competitive the AFC was. Eight teams were at 5-3 or better, fighting for five spots. Then the movie came out, and the Browns became the best team in football. After the movie came out, they truly became masters of the gridiron. A 26-16 victory over the Miami Dolphins on Monday Night Football. Back-to-back -back overtime wins against the Steelers and the Oilers, the latter of which I made a video about which you can check out in the upper right corner. They ended the season on a five-game winning streak and lost just one game in the second half of the season. All of a sudden, after beating the Chargers 47-17 in Week 16, the Browns were 12-4 and had acquired the number one seed in the AFC. Not since the days of Paul Brown did the Browns look this good playing football. For this reason, the timing of the movie coming out was nothing short of perfect. There were 40,000 copies of the movie made for distribution in Cleveland. All 40,000 copies sold out. I read multiple articles and blog posts to people around Cleveland during the holiday season who tried to get a copy of the movie from their local video store and couldn't because they were all sold out. The rest of the world had no idea that this movie existed, but in Cleveland, it was the hottest film in town. People loved the campiness and cheesiness of their team doing a movie like this, and the fact that their team was arguably the hottest team in football was the icing on the cake. Then came the divisional round game against the Jets. In a double overtime thriller, the Browns won 23-20 to advance to the AFC Championship. This was their first playoff win since 1969, and this was their first time ever playing in the AFC Championship. The Browns were one game away from making it to their first Super Bowl ever. Mike Babb was focused on making it to the big game. His wife, Lolis, was focused on the movie. Leading up to the AFC Championship, Lolis worked out a mass distribution deal to take Masters of the Gridiron worldwide. If and only if the Browns won the AFC, not only would the movie be mass produced, but Babb would get a $250,000 signing bonus and 10% of national and international distribution. Keep in mind that the average salary in the NFL back in 1986 was somewhere in the $200,000 range. Babb was one game away from striking it rich, and the Browns were one game away from having this video become a phenomenon. Heck, maybe even the Michael Stanley band was one game away from becoming stars, because I have no doubt in this MTV era that if this took off and began to get some airplay, that the song would have been huge. Everything was looking great for Cleveland. They were up 20-13 on the Broncos with 5 minutes and 32 seconds left in regulation. 
if their defense, which had been playing well all game, could just stop John Elway and company from driving 98 yards down the field to tie the game, then the Browns would be AFC champions for the first time ever. You all know what happens next. Elway drives 98 yards and scores the game-tying touchdown. Then in overtime, the Broncos hit a 33-yard field goal, win the game 23-20, and advance to Super Bowl 21. Just like that, not only was Cleveland's season over, but so was the possibility of Masters of the Gridiron taking off. Mike said that Lolis was distraught after the game, even more so than he was. Mike had no idea that Lolis worked this distribution deal out. When Lolis told Mike the hard news, Mike said, that's when I punched the windshield out. It's been close to 35 years since that heartbreaking loss, and it's been close to 35 years since the movie came out, but its legacy lives on. There is something incredible about Masters of the Gridiron. Nothing like this has ever been done before, and nothing like this has been done since. We've seen teams make songs before, and this even continued into the 90s, but a movie, especially on this scale, no. I'm not even sure the NFL or any team personnel would allow anything like this to happen again, especially a barbaric adventure movie involving sword fighting and going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a live animal. This is a perfect time capsule. This is something that only could have happened in the mid-80s. Whereas other teams were creating music videos, the Browns were out here creating a movie. Is it bad? Yes. Is it cheesy? Oh, you bet. But it is so charming and so much fun that I don't know how anyone can hate it. And fortunately, nobody on the Browns who participated hates it. In fact, members of the Browns who participated in the movie still remember it fondly, and often refer to each other by their made-up name in the movie. And a few players even said that this movie was the catalyst for their successful 1986 season. It brought the players closer together, and made them realize that if they could make a movie, then they could do anything. The Cleveland Browns have still never won a Super Bowl, nor have they made it to one. They're still looking for a coveted Super Bowl ring. But from now until the end of time, they'll always have this ring. In the eyes of Browns fans across the country, no matter how good or how bad the team may be, they will always be masters of the gridiron. Be sure to like this video and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JaguarGator9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.